In previous videos, we looked at the notion of ideals of rings, and today we want to look at a very special type of an ideal known as a principal ideal. So let's suppose that R is a commutative ring with one. So immediately that means that all left ideals are also right ideals, which are also ideals in general. So there's no notion of a sidedness of an ideal if we have a commutative ring. So then the principal ideal generated by A, so that's the notion that we're defining here, is given by the following. So the notation is these parentheses uh, with an A inside, and then notice it's all A multiple, it's all multiples of A as R runs through all elements from the ring. And notice here I put R on the right, but I could have put R on the left as well. Sometimes this is written in the following way, it's like R times A. So the first thing that we want to do is prove that this is actually an ideal. So the proof is pretty simple because um, this notion of a principal ideal is defined in such a way that uh, it's kind of obviously an ideal. So uh, let's go ahead and suppose that I is an element from the ideal. In other words, that I is in A and um, that R is an element from R. So uh, notice that that means that I equals um, A times R prime for some um, R prime in R. Notice I have to use like another letter there because I've already used R. And this comes from the fact that we defined this ideal generated by A in this way. Okay, so now uh, let's go ahead and check that it's an ideal. So we only have to check that it's one of a left ideal or a right ideal. So uh, we might as well check that it's a, a right ideal because that's maybe the easiest thing to do here. Um, so let's notice that I times R is the same thing as a times R prime times R, but that's the same thing as A times R times times R prime times R, but that's very obviously in the ideal generated by A. Okay, so um, that's all it takes to show that this is actually an ideal. So I'll clean up the board and then we'll look at some examples. So now that we've proved that this is actually an ideal, we're going to look at some examples. So uh, let's maybe first look in our favorite ring, Z. And in fact, commutative rings with one are in some ways just generalizations of the integers anyway. So the integers are really like important ring to understand. So let's maybe look at the ideal generated by three. So notice that's going to be equal to three times n as n runs through all of z. So I've changed my notation in order to reflect that we're working in integers here. But notice that's exactly what we used to call 3z when we were talking about um, this in groups. Um, okay, great. And now maybe let's uh, look inside of z15. Great. So uh, maybe let's take 2 inside of z15. So that's going to be given by 2 times n as n runs through all of z15. But the easiest way to do that is just to actually find all multiples of 2 inside of z15. So notice we'll have 2, that'll be like 2 times 1. Um, actually, let's start with 2 times 0, which is 0. Then we have 2 times 1, which is 2. 2 times 2, which is 4. 2 times 3, which is 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. So that's 2 times 7. 2 times 8 is equal to 16, but 16 is 1 in Z15. 2 times 9 is equal to uh, 18, but 18 is equal to 3 in Z15. And now you can see where we're going. 2 times 10 is 20, but 20 is the same thing as 5 in Z15. And then we have 7, 9, 11, and 13. But notice that's going to give us all of Z15. Now let's uh, look at maybe one more example. Let's look at the ideal generated by 5 in Z15. So that's going to be equal to 5n as n runs through all elements of Z15. But that's going to give us 5 times 0, which is 0. 5 times 1, which is 5. 
5 times 2, which is 10. 5 times 3, which is 15, but 15 is back at 0, so uh, we have those three elements. So now notice that 2 is relatively prime to 15, which also tells us this fact. 2 is a unit in Z15. In other words, it has an inverse inside of Z15. We actually noticed that 2 inverse was equal to 8 because 2 times 8 was 16, which is 1 in Z15. And this is an important property that if we look at the principal ideal generated by a unit, we're always going to get the entire ring. So I'm actually going to prove that on the next board. So I'll clean that up and then we'll prove that important result. So here's the result that we want to prove. If we have an element from A from R and we generate the principal ideal from A, that ideal is equal to the entire ring if and only if A is a unit inside of R. Let's recall that a unit means that A has an inverse. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and look at the proof. So let's do this forward direction first. In other words, we're going to suppose that A is in R with A is equal to the whole thing. So in other words, the principal ideal generated by A is equal to the entire ring. So notice, that means that every element from the ring is inside of A, including the identity one because we've assumed that we have the identity one here. So what that tells us is that one is inside this principal ideal generated by A, which means one is a multiple of A. In other words, there exists some B in the ring, um, actually let's maybe call it R in the ring, such that A times R equals one. Remember the shape of everything in this principal ideal is a multiple of A. So we have A times R equals one, but what that means is that A is a unit. And well, what's its inverse? Well, it's whatever um, element from the ring that brought us back to this identity, given the fact that this principal ideal generates the whole ring. All right, great. So we've finished that direction of the proof. And the reverse direction is actually going to be very, very similar. Um, and it's going to follow exactly in reverse. In fact, these are all if and only if statements, so there's actually not much to do, but I'll write it down um, just for to be thorough. So let's suppose that A in R is a unit. So what that tells us is that there exists some R in R such that A times R is equal to the identity. Great. But that tells us that this identity is inside of the principal ideal generated by A. So now let's suppose that B is in the ring and it's arbitrary. Now since one is in the ideal and B is in the ring, that tells us that B, which is equal to B times one, is also in the ideal by the absorption property of the ideal. But notice what this just showed us. This just shows, showed us that the ring is a subset of the ideal. But the ideal is obviously a subset of the ring. Um, be, so that tells us that the ring is equal to the ideal, which is exactly what we wanted to show. Okay, I'll clean up the board and then we're going to explore the ideals of Z. So to finish this proof, we're going to show that every ideal of Z is a principal ideal. So this makes Z something called the principal ideal domain. Now we're going to explore principal ideal domains a little bit more thoroughly later, but this is a nice uh, introduction to the notion. Okay, so here's how we want to do this. Let's go ahead and suppose that I in Z is an ideal. And then what we want to do is take the smallest positive um, element from the ideal um, and uh, take n in the ideal 
to be the smallest uh, positive, and I should really say here not positive, but non-negative um, element. Okay, good. So there are a couple of things to answer immediately, and one of them is how do we know that there are any non-negative elements? Well, that's actually easy to see. Notice if we have a negative number inside of the ideal, then we can just multiply that negative number by negative one, which is an integer, and then by the absorption property, the absolute value of that negative number will also be in the ideal. So this ideal is going to include positive and negative numbers by that kind of strategy. So uh, from here, we have the following claim, and that is that I is equal to this principal ideal generated by N. Okay, so our proof of this subclaim is going to go in the following way. First, we're going to notice that one of the inclusions is uh, fairly easy, and that is the principal ideal generated by N is obviously a sub-ideal of I. Again, that's like pretty easy to see. Notice everything in N is going to be in I by the fact that um, both of them are ideals. So the next thing we want to do is show that I is contained in N. So let's go ahead and suppose that M is an element from the ideal I and use the division algorithm. with um, M and N. So that's going to give us the following type of equation. It will give us M equals N times Q plus R, um, where R runs between 0 and N. It can include 0, but it can't include N. Okay, good. But notice what that tells us is that we can write this number r as m minus n times q, which um, is an element from the ideal. How do we know that it's an element from the ideal? Where Well, m is in the ideal, and n times q is in the ideal, given that n is also in the ideal. So uh, since uh, we have a closure, this type of closure property for ideals, uh, we're good to go here. Okay, great. But notice we found an element in the ideal that is smaller than n. So what that tells us is that this r needs to be equal to zero. So that means r is equal to zero. But if r is equal to zero, that tells us that m equals n uh, times q. That means that m is an element from the ideal generated by n. Great. So that tells us that the ideal i is a sub-object of the ideal n. And then this together with this tells us that these two ideals are the same. Now I should say here that we've glossed over the fact that if n is equal to zero, then this doesn't quite work because notice uh, there are no such R's that satisfy that. That's, like, that's an empty relation up here. So I'll just say that if N is equal to zero, then uh, I'll let you guys work out on your own that if the smallest non-negative element is actually zero, that tells you that this ideal itself is really just the zero set. So it's like a trivial ideal. It's not super interesting. Um, okay, so this is a good place to end this video.